The world of Fallout is quite compelling. It's a retro-futuristic landscape that's been ravaged by nuclear war. And while each game tends to add more exciting lore to the world and answer past questions that fans have had, there are still a handful of mysteries that we may never get the answer to. Let's go over some of them today. When is the exact divergence, and what caused it? The divergence is a bit of a hot topic and followed. I know I've spoken my piece on it a few times already. While it's confirmed that the world of Fallout follows a separate time to that of our own, it wasn't always like that. Major historical moments are shared between our universe and Fallout's. The World Wars, the 1967 Silver Bridge Collapse, Man Landing on the Moon in 1969. But for us what specific event caused our timelines to actually diverge, we might never know. A fan asked a question which was answered in Fallout Bible number 6. It reads, What was US slash world history like before the timeline included in previous Fallout updates? Chris Avalon answers, No one has asked this yet, but I thought I would cut this question off at the pass. Fallout takes place on a future Earth in an alternate timeline. I will not be including any information on how and when it diverged. It will remain as one of the mysteries of the setting. Just let it be known that it diverged after World War II, and leave it at that. But even saying it was sometime after World War II is a bit odd because World War II ended in 1945, so it seems like Chris is insinuating that the divergent event happened after 1945, but fictional soda makers Sunset Sarsaparilla claims to have been founded in 1918, before World War II, before the supposed divergent event. So, as for specific dates and events for Fallout's diverging timeline, it would seem that we will never actually get the answer. Like Chris Avalon said, it's just one of the mysteries of the setting. Speaking of mysteries, who is the Mysterious Stranger? The Mysterious Stranger has made an appearance in every canonical Fallout game as well as Fallout Shelter. He appears as a nearly mute man, typically dressed in a trench coat and wielding a 44 Magnum and tries to help the main protagonist during combat encounters. I say typically because the iconic garb of our mysterious friend wasn't common until Fallout 3. In Fallout 1 and 2, the mysterious stranger's outfit and weapon changed based on the protagonist's level, but I digress. So who or what is the mysterious stranger exactly? Well, this was the hot topic question of one synthetic private eye. The mysterious stranger case files can be found under a bed on the first floor of the Valentine Detective Agency. It reads, Case, Mysterious Stranger Sightings of a man dubbed the Mysterious Stranger have been popping up sporadically across the old US for years now. Best case, the man's an amoral lunatic. Worst case, a prolific serial killer. All anyone knows is his MO. Appearing suddenly, killing without remorse, disappearing without a word. The stranger has no known accomplices, no clear method for selecting his targets, no calling cards left behind. Sightings range from the NCR all the way to the East Coast, stretching back decades. Now, he's come to the Commonwealth. Last thing this place needs is another psychopath running amok. Time to start putting together the pieces to put this one away. Description: Human male. Outfits vary, but most recent sightings describe a large overcoat and fedora. Guy has taste, I'll give him that much. One man, multiple men, a ghoul with minimal scarring might explain long passages between sightings, appears and disappears suddenly, suggesting preternatural infiltration abilities slash access to advanced cloaking tech. All but the earliest description suggests the stranger only uses conventional arms, making infiltration training much more likely. Perps like this make me wish the institute had sprung for thermal detection before giving me the boot. Sighting locations, the Commonwealth? Confirmed. Capital Wasteland? Confirmed. NCR, old rumors, Shady Sands, really old rumors. In addition to Nick's open case on the man, it would seem that perhaps a relative of the mysterious stranger appears in Fallout New Vegas. The lonesome drifter can be found at a small camp north of the El Dorado gas and service station. When speaking with him, he explains that his childhood was uprooted by the departure of his father. Described as a real mysterious feller, the lonesome drifter's father would decide to never return to his family. As a result of this sudden change in the household, the drifter's mother began working hard to try and provide for her only son while he spent his time mastering the guitar. After a while, the drifter, at 15 years of age, began working in Montana's coal mines until his mother eventually passed away. Angry and resentful of his father, the drifter left Montana, bringing his father's guitar and mysterious magnum along for the ride. 
For years, he would traverse the wastes, performing for many factions of the hostile land, including the Dead Horses of Zion. By 2281, the Lonesome Drifter was tired of his nomadic lifestyle. He camps on the shores of the dried El Dorado Lake, contemplating his options. As for what I believe, I think the mysterious stranger might be multiple people part of some greater organization. These people recognize influential wastelanders and seek to aid them from the shadows. It would explain why the mysterious stranger has appeared in multiple locations, from Shady Sands to the Commonwealth, over the span of nearly 200 years, from 2102 to 2287. It would also maybe explain how the Lonesome Drifter got a hold of the mysterious Magnum. Maybe his father was once part of this secret organization, wanted out, and had to go into hiding to formally leave. This is obviously just a headcanon theory, as it's all speculation. The Valentine Detective Agency case files and the Lonesome Drifter's sad tale is all we really have for the canon lore of the mysterious stranger slash strangers. Will we ever learn more? What is the interloper slash visitor? In the depths of the Lucky Hole Mine is a large and strange dormant creature dubbed the interloper or firstborn of the wood. When the cult of the Mothman on the advice of the purple-eyed Mothman took shelter in the Lucky Hole Mine, some began to turn to a darker form of worship. Where some continued to worship their purple-eyed savior, others turned to a being known as the Interloper. This second group, the Dim Ones as they were known, would commune with the Interloper while worshipping the Red-Eyed Mothman. One cultist, Jeff Lane, claimed the Interloper called him in a series of visions. The creature invited Jeff into the depths of the mind so that he could become the Interloper's conduit of the unknowable and reveal to him a hidden reality. Now, as for what the heck any of that means, we can only speculate, but what we do know is that a series of six notes can be found in the mines, possibly discussing the interloper's origins and powers. They read, Your offering is acceptable to him. He is the one who came before, the firstborn of the wood. Blood wept from his branches and he shared with all his believers. The woods gave him life, gave him strength, but the blood gave him purpose. He gathered us, he taught us to share as he shared. His believers united by blood, he told us of our new home, that we would approach the faithless and be denied three times, but that he would open the way. His believers wept, for their new home lacked water and their throats were dry. He gathered their tears in his branches and spread them upon the earth, and from that came forth the springs. Blessed are you, first priestess of the wood. Through you we heard his voice, through you we gained his strength. So it would seem that the interloper, through powers granted to him by the woods, was able to create a freshwater spring and provide some sort of strength for his followers. As a sort of aside, according to Oxford Dictionary, an interloper is a person who becomes involved in a place or situation where they are not wanted or are considered not to belong. This implies that the creature is an entity that doesn't belong, whether that means it doesn't belong in the mine or in Appalachia, or even on earth, I'm not sure. Yet the poem from before describes the creature as being born from the woods. So where exactly is the place or situation that the interloper doesn't belong? We don't know, and we might never find out the rest of this weird branching monster's origins. In a similar vein, another sort of interloper type creature is the visitor. Found in the deep, the visitor has even more mystery associated with it. We only know that the creature is described as Visitor Corpse 01 in Fallout 76's game files, and a lantern next to the thing is a sure sign that we weren't the first ones to find it. What could the interloper and visitor be exactly? Maybe we'll find out in a future update, but for now, it remains as one of Fallout's greatest mysteries. Find Children Spy in the Followers Find Children Spy in the Followers is a side quest in the first Fallout. Former Vault 13 dweller turned Followers of the Apocalypse member tells the Vault Dweller about a Children of the Cathedral spy that has entered their ranks. He tasks the Vault Dweller with discovering this spy so that they can be ousted. However, the spy, a woman that we now know was named Heather, was actually cut from the game. So the quest can be started and accepted, but never completed. Because of this, the followers of the apocalypse good ending could never actually be obtained. Now of course with mods and fixes it can be achieved and the quest can be completed, but it's certainly strange that a quest that alters the game's ending was never fully implemented. As for why the spy was removed, it seems that we will never know. It's certainly strange. What are the growing pillars in the Big Empty? Okay, so this one is mad weird. So there's this location called the X-66 Hexcrete Archipelago in the New Vegas Old World Blues DLC. Now, the location in-game is nothing really special, featuring some Night Stalkers and some Trauma Harnesses, but it's what's not in the game that's a mystery. 
In an email correspondence with Chris Avalone, he reveals that Hexcrete was intended as a revolutionary construction method and material that did not quite end up being revolutionary after repeated tests. The Hexcrete towers at Big Empty are all that remains of this once great research project. And you know, there still isn't much mystery. What is so remarkable about this location? Well, let me tell ya. Avalone released a text file containing a cut ending for Old World Blues. The file is a long narration and describes a cataclysmic event that happened after the Big Empty's dome was cracked. Part of the narration reads, Communities began to vanish. Good Springs was crushed beneath bizarre hexcrete blocks that stacked to the sky. Chris elaborates on this ending on Twitter saying that hexcrete formations are chemically grown with the idea being that these pillars could have erupted in Good Springs had the think tank won. I would wager that there would need to be some starting form, like a plant growing from a seed, but if that's not the case, then could these hexcrete pillars be a true threat to the Mojave? We may never know. A strange and unassuming mystery in the third New Vegas DLC. What are the Zaytans doing with the Giddy Up Buttercups? Fallout 3's Mothership Zeta DLC has the lone wanderer being abducted by aliens aboard Mothership Zeta. When they inevitably begin their escape and make it to the ship's research lab, a whopping total of 109 Giddy Up Buttercup toys can be found. What are they for? Well, the Fallout 3 official game guide, despite being a non-canon source, might offer a bit of insight. It reads, A deactivated Giddy Up Buttercup lies motionless with test subject corpses strewn about her. It appears that Giddy Up Buttercups could be programmed to inflict horrific damage on the squishier parts of human anatomy. So it would seem that they can be programmed into deadly weapons. But what exactly is their purpose in the Zaytan's grand scheme? Could the massive amount of Buttercup toys be intended for a Zaytan cavalry division for their inevitable assault on Earth? Did George Wilson and Arlen Glass, the creators of the Giddy Up Buttercup, know about this ability to modify the toys programming to turn it into a deadly weapon? Did the US military know? Is this why Colonel Thomas Nelson wanted Wilson Automatoys to participate in their secret scythe program? We might never know. Who killed Sarah Lyons? and what happened to the other East Coast elders. Ah, my one true waifu, Miss Lyons. The daughter of Elder Owen Lyons, Sarah, was the first documented Brotherhood of Steel Sentinel to exist within the Fallout canon. Sarah Lyons commanded her own elite squad of Brotherhood Paladins and Knight Captains called the Lyons Pride. She would fight valiantly until her father's passing sometime after the events of Fallout 3. It was then that Sarah was promoted to Elder. Despite her important leadership position, Sarah continued to fight on the front lines until her own eventual passing while on the battlefield. The title of the Elder of the East Coast Brotherhood would pass from one ineffective leader to another until, to the Council of Elders approval back in the Lost Hills bunker, a 16-year-old Arthur Maxon was appointed as the group's Elder, the youngest known Elder of the Brotherhood. Now, whether it be a raider, super mutant, or something more conspiratorial, it's not a crazy claim to say that the death of Sarah Lyons changed the trajectory of the East Coast Brotherhood. Sarah, like her father before her, was a more humanitarian leader, turning against the wishes of the strict Brotherhood of Steel rules in favor of helping the people of the Capital Wasteland. And as she was still young too, 26 years old according to the game guide, Sarah was due for a long tenure as elder. Instead, under the leadership of Arthur Maxon, the group would turn back to their more traditional ways, hoarding pre-war technology and eliminating those who seek to abuse it. Had Sarah survived her battle, the events of Fallout 4, at least the Brotherhood's role in it, would be drastically different. Will we ever figure out who is the one that killed the prospective leader? Likely not. Is it part of some bigger conspiracy orchestrated by the original Brotherhood back west? Well, it's not my place to say. Is Adam real? The Church of the Children of Adam are a post-war religion built around the idea of worshipping radiation and nuclear annihilation as vessels of creation and life. The start of the religion is tied very closely to the construction of the post-war settlement Megaton. Zealots would come to worship the undetonated nuclear bomb. As manpower was vital for survival, several wastelanders came to the worshippers asking for help creating structures and homes around the payload. Under the condition that the bomb would remain undisturbed, the Zealots agreed, and so, bit by bit, Megaton was constructed, with the Children of Adam playing a pivotal role in the town's creation. But this video isn't really about Megaton lore, or even Children of Adam lore, so let's cut to the chase. Is Adam real? The Children of Adam's personified deity Adam, is he real? 
Now, I'll admit this is a bit of a loaded question, as I suppose the answer heavily relies on how tolerant you are of other people's religious beliefs. But the creator's true existence is something that I don't think will ever be confirmed or denied. What's going on with Dunwich? Now, if you've played Fallout and clicked on this video, you are probably expecting to see Dunwich here. And you're right. Dunwich Borers LLC was a drilling company founded by Richard Dunwich. The company would market and sell industrial acoustic drills. They had an office in the Capital Wasteland and operated a marble quarry in the Commonwealth. Now, Richard Dunwich and his sister, a woman named Constance Blackhall, had an obsession with the occult. This obsession is likely why both the Dunwich Building and the Dunwich Borers were constructed on top of ancient relics. An altar dedicated to a supernatural entity, Ugg Qualtoth, and some sort of massive statue, respectively. As for Constance Blackhall, after the death of her husband at the hands of the New Plague, she became the matriarch of the Blackhall estate. With her late husband's wealth now in her possession, Constance would use it to acquire an ancient book, the Kriv Bekni. With this, she became a sort of cult leader in Point Lookout and would spread the word of its texts. This was the way of life in Point Lookout for a long time, as it seemed that the Kriv Bekni was prolonging Constance's life for multiple generations. That is until the book was mysteriously stolen from her and her passing soon after. Now, who stole the book and what sort of other cultish powers the Dunwich Borers and Blackhalls are seeking, we might never know. I understand that all of this, the Dunwich, the Occult, etc., are a reference to Lovecraftian horror and H.P. Lovecraft's works, so maybe we're not supposed to fully know and understand what's going on. Dunwich, the Krivbeckney, and the Blackhalls will forever be one of the great mysteries of Fallout. And lastly, who's Pang Talon Company and the Gunners? Two major mercenary groups dominate their respective parts of the Wasteland, the Capital Wasteland's Talon Company and the Commonwealth's Gunners. Now, the actions and motives of mercenaries are usually driven by coin, so my question is, who's paying? As for Talon Company, they seem to be a ruthless bunch who will do anything for a paying customer, including slaughtering a settlement of women and children. The only client of theirs that we know for sure is a ghoul scientist working out of SATCOM Array and W05A. Her goal was simple, hire Talon Company as security for the site, while she attempts to connect to the United States military orbital satellites. By 2277, she managed to ping a nuclear orbital platform, High Water Trousers, but as she did not have access to a targeting platform, if she were to fire the platform's payload, it would land directly atop the SATCOM array. But I seriously doubt this scientist had the coin to coordinate all of Talon Company. She likely just hired a small squad for personal defense. Whoever is pulling the strings elsewhere, like who ordered the hit on the Lone Wanderer, will likely be a mystery forever. As for the Gunners, we know that Diamond City's upper stands have made use of the Gunners, with Wellingham employing the group's help for acquiring a pristine Deathclaw egg, but not much else is known about their other employers. So, who could possibly be paying them? Even Deacon speculates that the group may be following the orders of a third party, but is yet to learn who is truly pulling the strings. And just like Deacon, we may never know. And there you have it, that is 10 of the greatest mysteries that still exist in Fallout. Let me know if there are any others you think deserve a shoutout, maybe I'll put together a part 2. But that's all from me today folks, have a good rest of your day, cheers. Who's pulling the gunner's strings? No one knows.